There you go. Okay. So we've talked about some of the elements of Monai, some of the little features and some of the components that you use in an actual training process. But now we'll actually talk about a full training pipeline from beginning to end. So again, we start off with the usual stuff for a collab setup if you need to do that. Just get past that. So we want to talk about like the workflow and what we want to do to, to train a network from beginning to end. So from loading the data, doing our augmentation and our transforms, and then actually the training loop itself. And then what we actually want to do to evaluate our network and see how well it's actually learning the task we set to it. So we'll look at also how to use Ignite and how to do things in a more specifically Monai way with Ignite extensions. So we'll start off with the usual set of imports here and a bunch of transforms and, and a number of things. That's pretty straightforward. And then we're going to create a temporary directory for our data. And then we're going to pull down what we what's called the MedNIST data set. So this is a set of six different types of medical images that have all been shrunken down to 64 by 64. And it's just a very simple data set along in lines of the NIST digit data set, something that's going to be very small, very easy to download, and just an experimental set. So it's, we'll be doing a classification problem here, which is not terribly difficult and really not terribly practical for postage stamps. But anyway, it's just something to demonstrate. Uh, we also set our determinism to a seed here. And this is what we use to uh, set the, the random seeds in a global way for both the NumPy and PyTorch sites. So we do that for the sake of determinism. And having downloaded our zip file of data, we'll, we go through and categorize the images that we have and load them up. So we have these six different categories, hand, abdominal CT, chest X-ray, chest CT, breast MRI, and head CT. So we just get these, the, the identities one to, near zero to five. And so that's what we store in our image class along with the, the name for each file that we load. And I believe all these files are PNGs or JPEGs or something in non-medical particularly. So having loaded all of that, we can take a look at what we've got. We got roughly 10,000 of each category, except for breast MRI for some reason. I don't know why it's more. But that's the data set that we're working with. Pretty straightforward. As I said, 64 square. Take a look at a few examples. Uh, these look more or less like you expected. Abdominal CT looks different from the hand x-rays, looks different from the head CT. I don't understand why the chest CT ones look like this. I think we just chose a bad example, but that's, yeah, that's what you get. Um, yeah, so this is our example set of images. And then we want to go and prepare this data set. And what we want to do here is break up our, uh, our input and our classes into three different sets, one for training, one for validation, and one for testing. The one of the useful functions in Mona we have to do this is partition data set classes. And this will use the class labels to ensure that whatever partitioning you create will have the same balance of uh, of each class in them. So what we want to do is break this up into a ratio of eight to one to one. So what we'll pass in here is just the, the indices and then also the labels for each image. And then this will ensure that we'll get three different sets of indices that have the same balance of class labels in each. So that ensures that you have a, a validation set or a test set that is representative of your training set. And that's quite important to have to make sure what you're validating with is actually showing you a correct metric of how well your network is doing. Having done that, we can then define our usual transform sequence. So we want to load from the images, uh, add our channels usual. We can scale all the values of the images to zero to one, even though there are different modalities and typically you don't want to do that for, for CT, for example. We'll, we'll do it here just because it's a classification problem and it's, it's easiest. And then we'll introduce some randomized augmentations here of just doing a random rotation, flipping, and zooming. And those all have a probability of 0.5. So each of those will have a chance of being applied half the time for every, every um, instance it's run through. We then define also our validation transform, which is uh, very much the same thing, except without the uh, randomized transforms. We also define two extra ones here to uh, do activation, essentially. So. One of these will apply the softmax activation to whatever's input is, and the other one will convert whatever's input is into a one-hot format. And we'll see how those are used later on and what the purpose is of them. So we have two components, and what we want to do is define a data set that's going to give us both of those components, uh, the actual images and then the labels that go along with them. 
Uh, we could use one of the data sets you already have in Monai, but it's quite easy and straightforward to just inherit from PyTorch's data set class and provide our own methods. So that's what we've done here. We pass in the images, the image file names and the labels, and then our transform sequence. And then whenever we ask for an item, we apply that transform sequence to whatever the, the image file is that we put in and return also the label associated with that image. And that doesn't require any sort of augmentation of any sort, so we can just leave it be. So this is a straightforward way of uh, uh, doing things with just array transforms, so you don't have to bother with dictionary transforms or something else a bit more complicated. Uh, using our bedness data set, we can then create our data loaders. And because the, the whole data set can fit into memory, we're not terribly worried about using caching or other operations here. So we can get away with, 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 with doing this uh, very quickly. Even though we're loading from the file each and every time, the images will get put into uh, memory by the operating system for us. So it, uh, can, it's pretty well going to be uh, as fast as you can expect. Considering the images are so tiny, it really doesn't matter. So having done that, we then want to define a number of parameters in our network. So we want to choose a device. Uh, this is just a straightforward way to choose between either CUDA or CPU if you, uh, if you do or do not have a graphics card available. So uh, this will be well, the equivalent of either negative one or one of the devices that you've got. So we'll instantiate our network here and then move it to the device. And we'll then also define our loss function. We'll use our cross entropy this time. And then last, our, our atom optimizer with our learning rate set to uh, 1e negative 5. So with all of our pieces in place, uh, we can then go about defining our training loop. And this is going to look very much like a standard PyTorch training loop that we've seen before with other PyTorch examples. We will be adding the addition of using this metric to evaluate our network during evaluation time. So this is a class from Monai, and this will provide us a way of evaluating how well the network is doing uh, with our validation data set, and at the very end with our test data set as well. So what we'll do is we'll iterate through each epoch and then determine how many steps we have, and then go through each batch taken from our data loader. So we set our network to train mode, go through a data loader, uh, take each input and label out uh, and convert them to the device we want to use, uh, set up our optimizer to a forward pass through the network and then through the loss function, compute our gradients, and then step our optimizer. It's pretty standard PyTorch way of training your network. So do that, keep track of where we are in our epoch. And once we're done at the end of this training loop, once we've gone through all of the batches in our training set, we will then, with no grad enabled, uh, do go through all the images in our validation set. And we'll do this in a very similar loop here, except we have no loss function. We're just passing all of our input data, uh, input images in our validation data set through the network and storing the results, as well as the ground truth labels. So images and labels uh, will contain, in fact, our, our predictions are labels rather than images. So that should be that's one thing to change. And then what we'll do is concatenate those two together so that YPRED becomes uh, one single tensor with all of our predictions and Y becomes a single tensor with all of our ground truths. Now, the important thing we want to do here is to uh, apply our, uh, our activation to the so that we have a format appropriate for using with our metric. So we've put everything together into one giant batch and Typically, that's what you get as the output when you are, are, are doing validation in large batches. And so typically, that's where you want to use our function called decollate batch, which will take a batch of images or dictionaries thereof and break it down into a list. So this is the, the opposite of collating a batch together, essentially. So it's a little bit redundant here that we're catting things together and then breaking them apart again. But this is just for demonstration. So for, the, for our ground truth, we want to apply one hot to that so that we have one hot labeling for our uh, ground truth labels. And then for our predictions, we want to apply our softmax activation. So that will, of course, accentuate whatever the network thinks is the most likely class. So these two inputs we can then pass into our metric and then ask for it to aggregate the values together. So in this case, it's going to be taking the, the mean of all of them by default. I don't think we specified anything in our constructor. And then that will be our AUC value that we then store and 
uh, into this array, which we can then use at the end of training to, to graph with. And we also want to reset our metric so that it, its value gets reset. We can also calculate a simple accuracy metric. So here we can just compare our, uh, our raw predictions, taking the argmax of those against the original y values and comparing to see what is uh, equal or not. And then so then that will give us our metric of accuracy. And we can store that as well too. And use that to determine, uh, you can use the AUC metric to determine whether we've gotten a better result or not. And if we have, then we can store the parameters of our network to a file. So that's what this will do for us here. So uh, I won't sit here and train it with you. So I'll just say, we just did that. There's our final results at the bottom, our uh, AUC metric, our accuracy metric, and what our best AUC was at the very end. So we can plot some of our results now, looking at what our average loss is over time. This was just calculated at the end of each epoch. So there's only four values, but as you can see, that continues to, to decrease. Our validation AUC metric continued to increase over time. And so we got to the end of our training and it's near perfect. We can uh, then compute the same thing for all of our test images and look at some values for that. So all of our, our test data set, we can just run through the whole of that apply our network to each image in turn, ask for the uh, argmax of that prediction, and store that in these two arrays, y true and y pred. Having done that, we can then use uh, scikit-learn's uh, classification report to give us a little bit of information about what we have with our test images. So looking at a precision recall, it's uh, generally very good for the, for the categories we have. Uh, some of them are a little bit worse than others, but it's all pretty well high up there considering how simple these images are. It's really not too surprising. And we can look at some analytics with our confusion matrix, which is uh, a little bit less informative than you would have hoped. Uh, the, the color scale doesn't really help, but there's not much you can do about that. Considering how well it's done for its classification, it's really not surprising it looks like this. So having done that, that is, the whole way of doing training with Monite using just a straightforward PyTorch loop. So, you know, needless to say, I haven't shown you anything that isn't really huge diversion from how PyTorch works. You know, we're using their optimizers, we're using Monai's networks and loss functions, and a few other utilities like our metric. But for the most part, it's very much like you see with PyTorch. What we want to look at here now is using Ignite, which is a high level framework for defining a training or validation loop sequence. And this will provide us with a number of classes that encapsulate the structure within an object-oriented framework. So what the, the PyTorch engine class will do for us is encapsulate the whole concept of uh, iterating through epochs and iterating through each uh, batch in a data set as, as an iteration in your training process and alerting code to certain events as they occur. So when iteration completes or when an epoch completes, the Ignite framework has a callback system that allows handlers and other code to respond to when those events happen. And so uh, Ignite as well as Monai come with a number of handlers that will do various things at those points in time. So there'll be metrics that can compute metric values at the end of epochs, uh, checkpoint loaders and savers, uh, uh, schedulers for the learning rate so that when the end of an iteration or epoch is reached, the learning rate can be adjusted appropriately. And there's others like that. Uh, there's also a statistics handler. Uh, there's also a, a logger for metric values as well. So uh, this will be a, a, a very brief look at Ignite. So if you're not terribly familiar with it, um, I'm, I'm afraid to take a bit of time to getting used to exactly what's going on here. But anyway, we'll just do our usual imports for Ignite, pulling in their functions for creating supervised evaluator and trainer engine objects. And we'll just call that with the values that, that we have. So our, our network, our optimizer, and our loss function from above, we, we pass those in and that gives us our trainer object back. And that is the engine class that will encapsulate our training loop for us. Uh, we then calculate how many steps there are per epoch based upon how many images we've got. And then what we wanted to find here is a function that will essentially handle an event when it occurs during the training process. So in particular, we wanna say that when an iteration completes, we want to call this function. And what this function will do is pull some values out of our engine, which is passed as an argument here. Uh, its state object contains a number of values such as the actual output from the network itself, 
uh, the batch that was put into it, uh, the epoch number, uh, the maximum number of epochs. And so these are pulled out, some are stored in uh, lists and a diagnostic printout is created here as well too. So that's a, a very simple way of plugging into the training process. We can do something uh, very similar with an evaluator class. So here we wanted to find some metrics. So we we'll use their, the, the Ignite Accuracy class to compute our accuracy value in a more automatic way. And we have the, uh, the ROC AUC metric, uh, again, from Moni. And here we want to compute that metric for us at, at the end of each APOC, again. In particular, we need to use this function as our output transform to do our activation as we did above. So in this case, we will get a large batch and we want to decollate it explicitly here. So we want to apply our activation here. And here we want to do our one hot encoding of the ground truce. So this will do this for us. We pass in here as the output transform. This will then allow us to create our supervised evaluator passing these metrics in. And then we also want to define another handler that will be triggered at the end of an epoch. So whenever the, the end of the epoch is reached for the trainer, we will then call this function and this will give us our printout diagnostic and this will pull the metric values from the actual evaluator itself and then print those out so we can see what the results are for our evaluation. We also have a function for determining a score for when to save uh, checkpoint information. So that's what we define here is just the previous, the most recent value from our, our metrics. We'll use that as our score. And whenever that score uh, improves, that's when we actually will save a, a model checkpoint for us. So this will allow us to only save the model whenever its performance is getting better and not save it otherwise. So we will call the trainer's add event handler method, which invokes the same operation as using our decorators we saw above. And we'll pass in this handler and say it gets triggered at the end of an epoch. And the argument to pass to it, it will be this dictionary. So once again, we will then go through our training loop and that's all gonna be encapsulated in our Ignite classes. So we need only call the run method here and we get our usual output here. It will go through all four epochs as we requested and we look at our final value at the bottom. Our accuracy is pretty high. The AUC value is also pretty high. So that most recent one was our best metric for this run. So this demonstrates using Ignite classes with Monai directly. So the engine class that it provides is what we used here um, uh, directly. And so there is no extension needed with Ignite to be able to integrate with Monai code. And that's one of the good things about Monai. And as we said multiple times is that it is very much uh, opt-in and integration friendly with existing PyTorch code. We do in Monai also provide a number of classes that do extend the engine class from Ignite, and these provide a few extra facilities. Uh, some support for inverse transforms is necessary, and some other facilities are provided uh, for, for doing things like uh, specific events during iteration and for facilitating determinism. So what I have here is uh, the, the very same training process once again, that's slightly more simplified with only the um, AUC metric and not accuracy included. And we're not doing any sort of uh, saving of checkpoints here, but this will go through the, a very similar process, but use our supervised trainer and supervised evaluator classes from Monai engine submodule. So we want to define here a, a, a transform that's very similar to what we saw above, where we want to uh, apply our activation or our one hot encoding to individual values. If we have a list of them, we want to concatenate that list together. So doing a collation. If it's individuals, then we want to apply our activations. Uh, preparing the batch is something we need to provide because by default, these classes expect to uh, have dictionaries provided to them. So in this case, we need to uh, explicitly provide a prepare batch function that will pull the values out from our batch and convert them to the correct device. So we can then create our supervised evaluator first. And in this case, we again, pass in a prepare batch function. We pass in what our metric or metrics are in this case. Uh, and our post-processing is what we do with this, uh, this, this function up here. So having done that, and, and of course our, our validation data loader here, Having done that, we can then create our supervised trainer. And this very similarly has our arguments passed in as we saw uh, before, our device, our network, our optimizer, uh, our loss function. The handlers we wanna provide, we wanna 
link the trainer to the evaluator using this validation handler, which will handle invoking the evaluator at the end of an epoch for us. And of course, also prepare batches here. We also will provide the uh, callback uh, handlers here just to do our usual printout. So this will print out our epoch number, our steps, and what the training loss is. And then at the end of an epoch, it'll print out uh, what epoch we're on and what our um, uh, uh, AUC curve value actually is. So once again, if we run through that training, we see very much the same output. And then at the bottom, we have a slightly simplified result, but without the accuracy value, we just have here our AUC value. So that was a very, very quick introduction to how uh, a lot of uh, training can be done in Monai uh, that can uh, be very efficient once you get used to it. You know, the amount of code that's necessary to actually do the training can be quite reduced. One point that we do want to mention is about determinism. So as we saw earlier, we call set determinism at the very beginning to ensure that the random state that the transforms encounter is the same through each run. So if you were to start a notebook without that, then the, the random number generators would start in some random state and who knows where they would be. And so we want to use set determinism to ensure that the starting point is always the same. And so every time we run it from, from fresh, we get the same results as expected. If we wanted to change what the seed is or change it so that the seed is fixed for every time we run uh, a, a transform sequence, we can do that explicitly for each transform as we like. So here we can call set random state passing a seed and that will return uh, the self object in this case. So we can set the seeds for each individual transforms explicitly doing this. For doing the partitioning, because it relies on random shuffling, we want to do perhaps the same thing. So as we saw earlier, we use partition data set classes to break our, our data set into balanced classes. If we want to ensure that this is done in a deterministic way, we have to actually set our seed. So that's provided here. And then every time we run this, we will get the same images in the same uh, validation train and test breakdowns. At the end of this now, finally, so this has been uh, a, a relatively uh, fast notebook, I suppose, but we've gone over how we want to uh, load our bed in this data and train with it and visualize some information about it before and after our training process. What the whole training loop looks like from loading our data to defining our transforms and our data loader objects, and then what the actual training loop looks like and the various choices we have of, of training loops, whether to do things at the low level or to use high level classes like Ignite or our uh, specialized Ignite inheriting classes. So, uh, that's the end of this. We don't have an exercise for the end of this notebook because we were uh, expecting to go on to our lightning talks next. So, Michael. Yeah. Um, so we do have one question, Eric. I and Richard did kind of answer it and allude to it in the chat, but I wanted to just kind of why you still have the notebook open. People were asking about the collate and the the decollate um, methods. Do you want to touch on that again, just really, really quickly, um, just to kind of highlight why they have why we have decollate now implemented in Monai? So the, the decode, as I said, yeah, it breaks a batch up into an individuals. And we we do want this for some of the metrics because that's sort of what they expect to, to be. That's the input that they just, they're designed to expect. Uh, it's something that was also added for inverse transforms, which I think is more in Richard's ballpark and what he'll be talking about later on. So that was a, a technical requirement there. Yeah, definitely. And so Richard is going to be going over those transforms tomorrow in, in his notebook. So if you have a follow up question to that, definitely ask during that section as well. Um, if you have any more questions, definitely let us know. Um, but I can take back over and then we will head over to the lightning talks here in just a little bit. Um, thanks, Eric. Cool. OK, thank you. I'm going to share my screen really quickly again before we get started with the lightning talks. Um, and so there was a few different questions again in the chat about, um, I think people asked about lightning um, and I, we mentioned earlier Torch.io, um, kind of a, a few different things. I really want to highlight our tutorials repo for Monai. If you go through and you're looking for something that is using lightning, it's really simple to just do a control F, find in your browser, and it'll go through and find things that are based off of things like lightning. So if it's lightning is something that you use, and you want to see an example of how you can integrate Monai into that workflow, these notebooks are a great place to start. There is a notebook down here that has sort of an integration of Torch.io, PyTorch Lightning, and Monai all together. It's definitely a great notebook to kind of go through and show these different 
ecosystem libraries that are in the PyTorch ecosystem and how people actually use them in sort of a, a more real world example and how you might use these different uh, libraries to kind of bring together the best of a lot of ecosystem libraries. Um, Torch.io and Lightning, um, there's not a lot of connection. I think someone asked if there was connections between some of these. Torch.io focuses more heavily on um, input and IO. So we've worked with the Torch.io maintainer. Um, it's right here. And so this is another great library. Um, kind of look at, take a, take a look at how you might integrate some of the transforms that are in here. They have a lot of different ones that uh, might be helpful for you to be able to use. You can see they have a lot of great visualizations on the documentation. Um, so check it out. And then there are those tutorials there that will help guide you through how to sort of combine everything together so that you can use it in whatever workflow that you have. But again, really trying to highlight the different tutorials that we have available um, in our tutorials repo. I'm going to quickly scan to see if we have any other questions that we might be able to answer before we get started. So someone was asking about the data seed number. Um, and yeah, I can just be just whatever sort of number, just sort of making sure that you have a consistent data seed number represented. And that'll normally work per machine. Uh, Richard, I think, and you can chime in as well, is if it's on a different machine, it even though if you use the same number, it won't necessarily be the same machine to machine, but so long as you run on the same machine, then I think that that should keep it relatively the same for each run through. Um, let's see. Oh, no problem, Richard. <laughs> so Richard said correct. Um, so yes, so making sure you just set some, some seed that's in there um, and that should help you keep things fairly consistent between all the, the generators for there. 